uh, we're calling this authority and wisdom. The crowds who came to hear Jesus that we've been reading about were amazed at his teaching. <laughs> well, I guess we could figure that. Jesus didn't sound like one of their teachers of the law. They felt he had real authority to say what he said, more than just quoting the same old, same old that had been handed down from, <laughs> for years and generations. This is a lot like our traditional ministries do today because the congregation expects it now. If you don't teach what they've been li listening to all their lives and the, their grandparents, then they think it's some sort of a heresy. But God says, Jesus, God says he's going to sing a new song to us, and we should be listening for that new song through his Holy Spirit. Not just a song, but some authority and wisdom. Our first scripture in our continuing expository chronological study of the Gospels, I like that, will be from the paraphrased Bible, The Message. Do you know what a paraphrase is? A paraphrase is, is like someone just reading the Bible and then he rewrites it in, in everyday language. So it's kind of like a commentary, but it has all the truth there. Message is very well accepted nowadays. So anyway, that's a paraphrase. The other is, is translation, which is translated from the original writings until now. The message, Matthew 7, verse 28. It says, when Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. <laughs> well, that's what happens when a speaker gets up and speaks something that you just say, wow, you burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. 29, it was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. Quite a contrast to their religion teachers this was the best teaching they had ever heard. Anyway, look that up in your own Bible, Matthew 7, 28. I think you'll see that it says, and 29, and I think you'll see that it says about the same thing. Another point to remember, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he left us with authority to continue to do his work on earth in the same way. Our message should have that sort of an effect on people. It was like his power of attorney to do works in his name. When we step out to serve him with the gifts we have received from Jesus, people should also be amazed at what takes place with this authority and power of the Holy Spirit. Such authoritative and, and perceptive teaching had obviously won the attention of the multitudes wherever Jesus went. The, the religious leaders of, of that time were becoming concerned because of the extraordinary power Jesus had. Today, when a new church moves into our neighborhood, we too have certain, a certain amount of concern as board members and pastors. We try to get a meeting going here with the new church leaders in hopes of learning a few things about them. One, what is their doctrine? Two, does it appear that they are out to steal members, proselytes, from other churches, or are they going to grow their own congregation? And three, of course, the question in mind, why do we need another church in our neighborhood anyway? Aren't we doing fine just the way we are? But things really start to cook. They get pretty hot when God begins to fill them with his Holy Spirit and draws many sheep to them. The church, the old churches with no power will stay about the same. If some churches were given God's power but never used it, then God might take that gift from them and transfer his life-saving work to the new church on the block. It's a warning for you people there. I believe that this is why there are so many mega churches growing in the United States today and probably all over the world. And maybe not all that good. 
even though their pastors may now teach a false doctrine, they're still prospering, using God's power for their own motives. What could their motives be? Money, <laughs> power. Realize they can do some great things with a lot of people and a lot of money coming in. If so, they will have to pay the full price for their missing the mark of God's purpose. Having known God's plan once, but now compromising due to tasting success and power. Jesus has played an awesome inner power, which was translating into a real massive popular appeal. We can still do that. Jesus was definitely the superstar at that time. Maybe at first the people just wanted to come and see the show. They just wanted to come and see what they'd been hearing about for themselves. But then, after they came a few times, gradually they became aware of the fact that there was much more to this man, Jesus. Some began to believe the truth of Jesus, actually being the Son of God. Religious leaders notice this change in the people, but instead of accepting it with praise to God, they accuse Jesus of having power, not from God, but from Satan. Well, if you've read the Bible, you can see that it's there. The events leading to this confrontation begin to unfold as Jesus makes his way from the mountain back to Capernaum. We're going to get a mix of both Luke's writing and Matthew's now in order to understand all of this event. So let's turn to the New Living Translation, Luke chapter 7, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this, he went back to Capernaum too. Now the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. Three. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish leaders to ask him to come and heal his slave. Four. So they earnestly begged Jesus to come with them and help the man. If anyone deserves your help, it is he, they said, for he loves the Jews and even built a synagogue for us. Six. So Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends of his to, to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I'm not worthy of such an honor. Seven, I am not even worthy to come and, and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. Eight, I know, because I'm under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this or that, they do it. Nine. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. Now Matthew adds a little more to Luke's account. So we go to New Living Translation in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. It says, And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob at the feast of the kingdom in heaven. 12. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be cast into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 13. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go home. What you have believed has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. And again, seven, Luke 7.10, 7, in Luke, he goes on to say, And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. So Matthew and Luke working there together. Can you see now how the four Gospels will work together like this? Giving confirmation of important happenings in the life of Jesus. 
So it's great to put all four of the Gospels together and just see who's writing about what and when. And if they're writing about the same thing at the same time, then two witnesses make it a doctrine. Remember, Capernaum was the headquarters for Jesus. Ever since his rejection by his own hometown, Nazareth. Let's go back to the message for this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. The message says, He moved from his hometown, Nazareth, to the lakeside village, Capernaum, nestled at the base of the Zebulun and the Naphtali Hills. Sadly, we too sometimes have to leave our home base due to misunderstandings, ignorance of truth, and intolerance. We have to leave a place where we thought we were going to be, where we were raised, and then being unable to serve God effectively, the very place we called home and loved. It's sad. God calls us out to serve somewhere else because we can't serve there where we had been planted originally. We hear that many of God's homosexual Christian servants have suffered being rejected and persecuted by church and family, not from anything they had done, but just because of the, the way God made them and who they are, not giving any consideration to why God made them the way they are. And this causing the Lord to move them away to a different place in order to better glorify Him. God knows their pain. You think they just, this, He's just letting that happen? He knows their pain and He hears their prayers and will bless those who continue in Him, even with all that persecution and all they have to give up for Him, as He does the eunuch. Have you read about the eunuch? We're going to continue over at our lounge. In our last scriptures about the centurion, we saw first the nature of the human. As the elders were trying to impress Jesus with the worth, worthiness of the centurion, right? But the centurion was saying, oh, please, I'm no good. Don't come to my dirty house. Just command that my servant be healed. And second, we see the nature of Jesus. His nature simply being to heal those because of their belief and faith. And that is what he did. We might recall by this story that it's our belief and faith that brings prayers to be answered for us too. Let's go to the next step in the ministry of Jesus. And once again, in Luke in the NIV this time in chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to, town, to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. 12. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he cried, Don't cry, 14. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up, 15. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. 16. They were all filled with awe and praise God. Of course. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. 17. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Now, as he sits in prison, John the Baptist is getting wind of all that's going on. Jesus receives a message from John the Baptist. The message is asking Jesus for a final confirmation of his being the Messiah. So let's go to NIV, Luke 7, and continue on here, verse 18. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling two of them, but 19, he sent them to the Lord to ask, 
Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? 20. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one to come? Or shall we expect someone else? 21. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. 22. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind received sight. The lame walked. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. 23. Blessed is a man who does not fall away. There is on one thing we must always consider when we think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. John may be sensing his impending death and undoubtedly wants assurances that his own ministry has been correct. You remember at the baptism of the Holy Spirit filled Jesus. So it's my thought that maybe the Holy Spirit was not in John the Baptist where he had this this gift of being able to see as Jesus could, or as we do now, that we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Anyway, NIV, Luke 7, 24, says, After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? 25. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. 26. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. 27. This is the one about whom it's, it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you and will prepare your way before you. 28. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Then Matthew sticks something else in here. In NID, Matthew 11, verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been in forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Here's the big one. 14. And if you are willing to accept it, Matthew says, he is the Elijah who was to come. 15. He who hears, let him hear. Luke didn't confirm what Matthew reported about John being the Elijah, that Jesus said John was the Elijah. Uh, Luke didn't confirm that with Matthew, so maybe we just hold on to that. But adds more to this event as follows. In, in New Living Translation, Luke 7, 29, it says, When they heard this, all the people, including the unjust tax collectors, agreed that God's plan was right, for they had been baptized by John. 30. But the Pharisees and experts in religious law had rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. 31. How shall I describe this generation, Jesus asked. With what will I compare them? 32. They are like a group of children playing a game in a public square. They complain to their friends, we played wedding songs and you weren't happy, so we played funeral songs, but you weren't sad. 33. For John the Baptist didn't drink wine, and he often fasted, and you say, He's demon-possessed, 34. And I, the Son of Man, feast and drink. And you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard. 
and a friend of the worst sort of sinners. 35. But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. So if we're following, if, no matter how rotten we are, if we're following the teaching of Jesus, then His love for us and His friendship with us shows that His wisdom was right, that our lives can be changed. So, through these experiences of the Gospel writers, we can see clearly the authority and wisdom behind all of God's plans for us. God may have used you too in strange ways at one time, ways that no Christian would identify as a righteous person. We may have done things of which we still continue praying to God for forgiveness when actually all was forgiven and forgotten. Here we have Icky has come to join the teachings when we gave our lives to Jesus Christ. Did the Lord send you Icky to join us here at the teaching? Learn to have tolerance for those you don't understand. Consider that God is doing something very special in their lives. Something that glorifies God in ways we can't under imagine. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your promises And nothing seems worthwhile Except to be In your kingdom of love my Lord